Hi, welcome to What's the Word. I'm your host, Jamie McFadden, and I'm so excited to have you here. This podcast is about all things wellness. Each week, we will focus on a word of the day, and I interview some of the most inspirational people I know and share that inspiration with you. Join me. Let's learn together on What's the Word. This is the place where I Hi, and welcome to What's the Word. I'm your host, Jamie McFadden, and this podcast is about all things wellness. Each week, we focus on a word of the day, and I interview the most inspirational people I know and share that inspiration with you. Today, we have a very special guest, someone that I have looked up to and been inspired by in so many ways. In fact, his book has quite literally changed my life, and it's a book that I've bought for almost all of my clients and friends. He is a best-selling author who's written over 40 books, founder of the Hendricks Institute, psychologist, teacher, and today we get to celebrate his brand new book, The Genius Zone. It is such an honor to have you here. Welcome, Gay Hendricks. Thank Thank you you so much. much. (laughs) Great to be with you, Jamie. Thank you. Well, today our word is commitment, which means, by definition, the state or quality of being dedicated to a cause or activity. So I want to just dive in with you right here. Why did you choose that word and how is it resonating with you today? The main reason is because you don't get anything in life unless you're consciously committed to getting it. On the other hand, a lot of us are getting things that we don't like because we have unconscious commitments that we don't know about that's actually causing negative things to happen. You know, like if you have an unconscious commitment to avoiding something in yourself, well, that thing is just going to keep knocking on your door all the time. You know, if you try to keep yourself from letting yourself feel your fear or your anger or your sadness, that's going to keep just coming up to you all the time because life is always interested in having us learn more about ourselves. It's our open-hearted commitment to learning that gets us to where we really want to get to in life. And so commitment is incredibly important for a couple of reasons. One is that Katie and I are just about to celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary. Okay. Congratulations. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and so in 1980, I made a commitment to her, a series of commitments to her, and she made a series of commitments to me, but they weren't the usual kind of commitments that people give like in wedding vows, you know, like a wedding vow. I mean, I promise to love, honor, and obey you every day of my life. <laughs> Those kind of things don't work very well. What you really need to commit to, to make a relationship work, is make a commitment to speaking honestly, telling the truth all the time. Make a commitment to taking responsibility for things when they come up rather than going automatically into the blame game. Make a commitment to providing encouragement and appreciation to your partner. Those kinds of things are important because they're actual processes that you can make a commitment to whether you can know And and you can know whether or not you did it or not, because if you make a commitment to expressing more appreciation to your partner and then you don't, you've you've got some kind of a block there that needs to be addressed. And so commitment, another reason I chose it is because I've found that commitment opens a kind of a energy in ourselves that nothing else opens up until you've got your heart and mind in harmony dedicated to a particular thing, you don't really make any kind of rapid progress toward it. But if you can get your heart and mind into a commitment, boy, human beings can just make miracles happen. Wow. Well, well, quite the intro there. Thank you so much. And I love just how you dove in. And first of all, Katie, your incredible wife, who now you guys are celebrating 40 years marriage. I mean, let's be real here. I, I, I think the statistic is that 
more often than not, marriages may end in uh, divorce or maybe just staying in a relationship where you're committed because of those vows you made or the children or whatever else, but you're not necessarily living your authentic power or true self with each other. And um, just hearing you talk and reading your books and you always talk about so often the kind of the, the process as opposed to the outcome making the, and you just brought up again, the commitment to, to what you're going through and feeling the fears or the anxieties or the things that come up, but having that honest truth about it. Do you have anything that you can share with anyone listening? Because a lot of my listeners right now, especially through the last couple of years between the pandemic and politics and you know everything going on in the world, there's so much disparity. And many of them are feeling lost and feeling, um, you know, they don't know who to trust or are they worthy of this love or commitment or all these things. Do you have anywhere for someone that's going, okay, I like this, but where do I even begin? Do I commit to myself? Where, where do I start? One of the most important things any human being can do is make a couple of commitments to yourself. And one commitment would go something like this. I commit to learning to love myself more every day of my life. The reason for that is because you don't get love in your life from another person unless you've given it to yourself. Because mm -hmm. if you don't love and honor yourself, if another person tries to give you love, you get defensive about it mm -hmm. and push it away. And so uh, one of my first books was called Learning to Love Yourself. Actually, I wrote it the same summer I met Katie. Interestingly wow. enough, it, it's, <laughs> it's still selling like hotcakes 40 years later um, because it's a universal problem. And learning to love yourself is learning to love all of yourself all of your feelings, all of your thoughts, all of your forgiving yourself for the things you've done in the past. And that's so important because unless you have really loved yourself thoroughly, you're always gonna live in a space of self-criticism. And that's gonna draw the criticism of other people. In, in life, you get what you, you know, it's really true that uh, you reap what you sow, so that if right. you don't love yourself and honor yourself deeply, that's going to result in a lack of love and honoring from other people. So step number one, I think, is to focus in on making a commitment to learning, your, uh, to loving yourself more every day. The second thing that I'm really interested in these days is for people to make a commitment to bringing forth more of their genius every day. You know, the new book is called The Genius Zone because the genius zone is open to everybody 24 hours a day. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> you don't have to pay to get in the door. You have to make a little adjustment inside, which is first of all, making a commitment to your genius. Even if you don't know what your genius is yet, making a commitment to learning about it and open up. See, I don't think in my work, I don't think genius is as mysterious as people give it. You know, a lot of people <laughs> avoid thinking of themselves as a genius, but your genius is what you most love to do and what makes your biggest contribution to other people. That for me is the sweet spot of genius. So it doesn't matter if you make a genius soup or write a genius symphony, or drive your kids to soccer practice in a genius way. It's all the same, and because you're opening up and tapping the deepest part of your creativity. Right, and you talk a lot about creativity as well, um, and I love that so much. And The Big Leap has been a book, like I said, that inspired me to even take multiple leaps and bounds, and to learn to love these parts of myself that maybe I didn't love or I was fearful of, and um, and so can you just talk a bit about the creative process for someone listening right now going, okay, I want to step into this, but I do have these fears and I don't know where to, where to start. Really important question because a lot of people don't think they're creative. In fact, I hear people tell me that all the time and it just <laughs> drives me nuts. Uh, you know, I'll be talking to a hundred people in a, in a zoom room about this subject. And I can predict that at least two or three people are going to stick up their hand and say, you know, I've never been a creative person. Mm -hmm. uh, I hate to hear that because it's so disempowering. I mean, look, if you got out of bed and learned how to turn on your computer, you've already got, 
<laughs> a lot to be proud of, you know, just the, uh, the fact that you can move around through life in a creative way. That lets me know you're already in touch with the creative. Now you just need to breathe on it a little bit and open it up. But here's the interesting thing. I hear people all the time start out when we're doing seminar saying, I'm not a creative person. By the end of the seminar, they realized they were wildly creative their whole lives. They just didn't have a context to put it in. Mm -hmm. That's the reason I advocate people asking themselves the question, what do I most love to do? You know, like in my work, what do I most love to do? If I were going to spend eight or nine or 10 hours a day doing something what would I most love it to be? I started asking myself that question, you know, 40 or 50 years ago and, and got some answers. And so I've been doing what I most love to do for the past 40 years. And I'll tell you, I want everybody in the world to do that because I want everybody to feel as good as I do. And it's there. It's there in all of us. We just need to open up and get that stuff on the line and start bringing it out into the world. And it starts with commitment. You need to, you know, like when we started out, Katie and I started out in our relationship, we didn't know if we could accomplish what we wanted to accomplish with each other because we made commitments to things that we didn't know how to do yet. Right. And but that's important because if you make a commitment to something that gives you a big stretch, that's what you want to do because you know, if you made a you know, I commit to lit, sitting on the couch eating corn chips and watching TV all day. That wouldn't be a very big stretch for a lot of people. Right. But if you make a commitment to expressing more of your genius every day, that can take you into some really interesting new territory, even if you don't know what that is yet. Right. I, and I love that you brought that up. And that question is, it's, it's so simple yet so profound that just taking time, whether it's to meditate, to pray, or to just go somewhere for a few minutes and ask yourself to anyone that's listening. I do this all the time. Still, I'll check in, you know, every once in a while with myself and say, what do I love most about what I'm doing? What, what just makes me feel like I'm in that genius zone? Cause when we're in that genius zone, it's that state of flow where you're everything, it just things feel right. And I think for any of us, we, we all want to feel more and more of that. And yet we seem to get stumped by either the noise around us or the, the internal struggles or the fears, um, or maybe the conditioning that we have within our own mind that we grew up, you know, believing these certain things that maybe aren't true. Um, so I'm curious because you are someone and Katie as well, who you have inspired. I mean, I have, I would have to say millions of people there. There are so many people I know that just love your work, appreciate what you do. And, and I'm curious, you know, was this something that like, what sparked that for you? How did you get that spark? Hmm. I would say, uh, do, I, do, uh, do we have time for me to tell you a story about what happened when I was 24 years old? I would because love that it if that's okay with thing. you. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I forgot to look at how much time we have today. So if I'm not in a hurry, let me tell you the nitty gritty of what happened when I was 24 years old, because it set off the spark of everything. In fact, just starting to tell the story of it, I can feel some tears in the back of my eyes. So uh, forgive me in advance if I shed a tear or two during this process, because I wouldn't be here without what happened on this particular day in 1969, way before you were born. Uh, there was a world here before you were born, believe it or not. <laughs> anyway, in 1969, I was 24 years old. And I'd been struggling with a medical problem my entire life. When I was born, there was something wrong with my uh, glands, like my pituitary and my thyroid gland, because they didn't put out anything. And therefore, uh, my body always ran cold and I put on weight very fast. So by the time I was one year old, I was one of those real fat babies that kind of looked like a Buddha or Jabba the Hutt. It, you know, I, I had rolls of fat all over me. So there was something wrong and I was taken around to different specialists throughout and nobody ever figured out what was going on. 
I took shots for a while. They took me around to different places, uh, specialists, and I got shots. And then I got put on a radical diet when I was 14 that took some weight off me, but I had to take amphetamines to do it. And it kind of made me crazy. And so by the time I was 24 years old, I weighed 300 pounds. If you look at me right now, I weigh about 180 pounds. I'm six feet tall. So I look tall and athletic basically. And but I weighed 300 pounds, 120 some pounds more than I weigh now. I smoked heavily Marlboros and I put away two or three packs of Marlboros a day. I was in a very toxic relationship that I couldn't figure out how to get out of. And I was also in a crappy job that paid me uh, less than hundred dollars a week to work in a school for juvenile delinquents where I was a combination of a teacher, counselor, and bouncer, <laughs> I would say, because these kids were pretty rough, you know, and the, the worst day of my two years there was when I came across a kid who had his head wrapped in a towel soaked in glue, and so he's a glue sniffer, basically, and he was very high, and I took the the towel away from his head because I was afraid he was going to asphyxiate himself. Yeah. And he pulled out a knife and chased me down the hall, uh, trying to stab me with this big butcher knife. And uh, I uh, got in, got in behind a door in time and, and locked the door. So he didn't get to me. Uh, fortunately, people that are stoned on glue aren't very efficient at chasing people. So he was stumbling all over the place and falling oh down God. and everything. But anyway, I hid from him behind this big door. So that was my worst day there. Uh, so that'll give you a flavor though of the kind of work I did at the time. So I was in this job and I got into a big argument with the woman I lived with at the time, Linda. And I went out to clear my head. It was a winter day and it had snowed in New Hampshire. And I stepped on a place where the snow had covered up an icy slick and my feet shot out from under me and I went wham down on my back. I hit my head, but I didn't knock myself out, but I kind of knocked myself out of my usual personality for about two minutes. And I had this amazing thing happen during that two minutes. It was like I saw myself in an entirely new way. I could feel down through all of these layers of emotion I had in me, like things I was angry about going back to day one and sadness that I had never realized. My father had died with me. I, I died uh, when my mother was pregnant with me. And so uh, apparently what had happened was it had turned off, uh, her grief process had turned off some hormones that babies need to have to have a normal thyroid and everything. So all of this stressful stuff had happened before I was born that kind of programmed my thyroid and everything. And I didn't know any of this at the time. I had learned it later on. So here I was, I was lying on my back in this what I call an out of Hendrix experience. You know, it wasn't, <laughs> I was in my normal state of consciousness. I could feel all the way down to the very center of myself through all of these layers of emotion. But here's the magic at the center of everything down at the bottom of all of my emotions, when I was really open and allowing myself to feel everything fully in that expanded state, I could feel how that we have this state of pure consciousness in ourselves that's much deeper than any of our emotions or our thoughts or anything like that, that it's our natural birthright that we have this pure consciousness that doesn't have any programming on it. Mm -hmm. And while I was feeling that, I realized, oh my goodness, it's like I'm getting a fresh start I'm down in the place where I was before any conditioning or programming, before my father died, before my obesity, all of that kind of stuff happened. And I realized I could redesign my life from that space. Then what happened was I started coming back into my normal state of consciousness again. I could feel I could feel my fat body again, and I could feel myself cold lying on the ice. But here's what I did. 
I made a commitment, and this is why our word is commitment. I made a commitment to experiencing that pure consciousness in every moment of my life. And so then I just came back to my regular old life and it disappeared, but I still had that commitment. And so I started doing things differently from that day forth. I went back home and instead of eating a bowl of ice cream or a hamburger or a three or four hot dogs or something like that, I instead I asked myself, hmm, what would feel this new spirit or uh, pure consciousness? I, I, I eventually called it my spirit. What would feel, what would feed my spirit? And within a year, I lost more than a hundred pounds. And I became one of those rare one or 2% that lose a hundred and some pounds and keep it off for my whole life. So I still get actually letters from obesity uh, experts asking me about that because apparently a very small number of people lose a lot of work, weight and then keep it off. Uh, for me, it wasn't that hard though because I just kept avoiding the stuff that I used to eat and asking myself what would feed my spirit. And I started doing that with people too. Like would being around this person feed this new part of me? And I got a visit I'd lost maybe 75 pounds and I got a visit from an old friend of mine that we used to smoke dope together in college and eat pizza together. He was obese like I was, but he actually tried to sabotage my diet by bringing some chocolate caramels. He went into town and bought a five pound box of chocolate caramels, which is, you know, like the ultimate favorite food of mine at the time. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so um, I actually ended up kicking him out of my house. I said, no, that's so contrary to what I want to be doing right now. I just can't stand to be around you right now. Interestingly enough, he had a heart attack and died at age 26, about a year or so after I had kind of given him the boot. So I felt really sad about that. But in a way, I just couldn't be around that toxicity anymore. Mm -hmm. I always say the secret of success is you learn to get really good at saying yes, and even better at saying no. <laughs> because if, you, if you're a yes sayer, but don't know how to say no, you can get into a lot of trouble that way. Just if you're a no sayer and never say yes, that's another type of way you can uh, limit yourself. But anyway, back to the story. Within a year, I'd lost a bunch of weight. And I'd gotten out of that relationship. And interestingly enough, too, I was able to pass my driver's test for the first time without wearing glasses after that experience. Wow. And so that was a big eye opener for me that I could actually change yeah. a physical thing like yeah. eyes by doing that kind of a, a kind of a radical diet where I was only... Right consuming spirit kind of things. But later on, I learned how to meditate too. And that made it much easier because I've been a long time meditator. I learned how to meditate when, well, let's see, in 1972, so 49 years ago, and I've been meditating every day since. And that helps me keep that pipeline open to that pure consciousness inside. Certainly. Wow. Well, first of all, thank you so much for sharing your truth and that story. And I, I, so in my line of work, I'm a self-care specialist and I've worked in the fitness industry for the last decade um, alongside people like Jillian Michaels and really helping with weight loss and things like that. And, um, you know, I, I see it on a daily basis. My clients are struggling, whether it's, you know, the weight or whether it's a lot of the times it's what, whatever they're really carrying that they can't let go of. There's a big element of, you know, not really understanding how to let go. And, um, maybe trying to overcommit to things, you know, too, too much, like how you said, like even with the, the marriage vows, um, by making this really big, huge promise that you're not really sure if you can fulfill it and you don't even have these baby incremental steps of how you're going to even start to get there. Um, and so even just you saying, taking that moment and thinking, what would feed my soul right now? I think that that is such a profound thing that anyone listening right now we're living in a world where, you know, luckily mindfulness and meditation has become more popular. 
and it's become something that you know isn't this weird you know oh disillusional thing it's like no we're waking we're waking up we're we're starting to listen to what's in here and so you know for my listeners right now and for anyone that's that's hearing or watching this you know i want to acknowledge you because you're you're sharing your truth that this wasn't just i think i'm sure that some people may look at you kind of how they do with me sometimes and go oh you just probably always were fit or you always always were right you always were just great at relationships or you always and i'm like no i've been in toxic relationships i had depression anxiety you know all these things i'm like no it wasn't always this way however i made a commitment to be responsible to myself and i made a commitment to learn to listen to what i needed outside of the noise which sounds very similar to what I've learned, you know, in, in working and studying what you do. So this is just brilliant. And now you have a daughter. I have a daughter too. You have a daughter, right? Yeah. Mine's um, probably a lot older than yours. Is. <laughs> so mine is four. Um, and I will say the, the commitment of parenthood and being able to live in the genius zone, um, can be really trying at times with a, at least a four-year-old I'll say where, um, I really want to focus on being creative. And, and I know a lot of parents will say similar things like, oh, parenthood is just, it's like a, a crapshoot. Like it, it, there's just, it's always different. Now with you having your expertise and all that you do, um, like how has that, has it, has it shaped things that you've taught your daughter or like, how has that relationship been? Cause you are someone that you, you know, so much and you're so well-versed and I'm like, Oh, I wonder, you know, I'm like, Oh, I want to learn everything from you. I wonder what that's like for your daughter. <laughs> I can guarantee you it's not. My daughter is, uh, <laughs> she's in her fifties now, but she's been mm -hmm. only interested in art since the pretty much the time she could stand up and hold a pencil or a paintbrush in her hand. Wow. And as a matter of fact, when she was, let's see, how old was she? She was about 10 years old, I think. And she told me that she decided she wasn't going to get married until she was 27 years old. And I said, <laughs> I said, <laughs> why? And, and why? Did, how'd you pick 27? And here's what she said. She said, if I got married, it might interfere with my art. At 10 years old, she said that. Wow. And she's been like that ever since. So she lives on a houseboat up um, in the Bay Area. I live down in Southern California. And uh, first of all, I hate boats. <laughs> <laughs> I get seasick, you know, just stepping onto a boat, even just requires an act of courage for me. And uh, so anyway, we're about as different as two people can be because she she can't live on land and I can't step on the boat. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, so I just want to say that it's possible to have uh, children that are very different from you. Right. And also she, she didn't like the whole psychology aspect of stuff. Uh, she would rather see people express their pain through art rather mm -hmm. than go to a therapist, you know? And right. I say, Hey, it's just as easy to make great art when you're feeling great. You know, you don't right. have to suffer for your art. But anyway, um, I kind of let her be, you know, she does her right. thing and I don't really try to influence her. Um, if I probably tried to influence her, she'd tell me to shove it. So uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, uh, I forget how we got on the subject of, of uh, well, oh I, yeah, be, well, because yes, you have a daughter a too. Oh, yeah. here, here's the thing. Uh, one of my friends who is a yoga teacher who has three kids, she said, really, this has really made an impression on me. She said, if I give myself one hour a day, I can give back 23 to my husband and my kids and my work. But if I don't give myself that hour a day, I can't give back anything. I just don't feel, I feel depleted. And that was really uh, that made an impression on me because I think that's such an important thing as you become a professional or a parent or a parent and a professional, all of those kind of things have natural pulls at your time, but you've got to remember to sit down and be with yourself to meditate or journal or go right. for a good run. You know, like I do all those things. I, I, uh, I'm big on resistance training. I found over the last 10 or 15 years of my life, 
I do, I play golf and I ride my bike and that kind of thing. But resistance training has been a key for me because it, it's building up muscle at a time when everybody else is losing it like crazy. Yes. You should see the chart about loss of muscle mass after you're 60 years old. It looks like yes. a, a set of dropped car keys. You Right. Uh, but, you know, I've actually put on four or five pounds of muscle over the last 10 years, in addition to losing more fat uh, because of that uh, getting conscious resistance, you know, we're right. all going to meet resistance, but right. let's take it on and be conscious about it. So the big point is that I want to just convince everybody to give yourself some time every day. It's a discipline, but it's a discipline that pays off hugely with your kids. Oh, I, that, okay. Well, that segued perfectly into my next question because I work, I have a self-care brand and it's, um, it's been amazing to see how quickly and rapidly this has become not just a buzzword, but really we have six pillars of this health that I w help work on and I have a big referral network and all this. But what seems to be the common theme, because I work with a lot of parents, busy working parents, is the excuse of there's no time or not feeling worthy deeply um, and putting everybody else first and then feeling, oh my gosh, I, I, I'm, I'm out of it. So what you just said is exactly that, like that, and what your yoga friend said that by making that time for yourself, like putting on your oxygen mask first, then you can help someone else. If we can serve ourselves and actually love ourselves, even, and I love how you always talk about the parts that either scare us or we might not be so fond of, or maybe we don't want to think about. Um, so my question to you is this, how do you best practice self-care and, you know, just any tips on self-care that you can give to our audience? Yes. Um, well, I'm kind of, since I had that experience when I was 24, I've kind of become a zealot, you know, so I, <laughs> I walk every day. I ride my bike just about every day. Katie and I take walks together. And uh, actually I was just on a, a show in Paris, France, just an hour ago. Wow. And I was reminiscing with the host about Katie and I, went to Paris a few years ago just to walk on streets we'd never walked before on Paris on wow. other visits. And so we mapped out all of these journeys that had us walking about 10 miles a day. And as a result, even though we ate crazy good food for 10 <laughs> days, we both came back and had lost weight, right. actually lost seven pounds in Paris, you know, if you can believe that. Uh, but um, so I, I kind of go to extremes. I played uh, three hours of golf yesterday and plan to play a round of golf tomorrow. And also um, Friday, uh, eating is something that's really changed my life, uh, learning how to eat differently. Uh, Katie is a master chef. Oh, she's unbelievably great cook. And she only likes to cook once a day uh, so she makes our lunch. Usually if we're both here, she makes our lunch. Um, I eat a simple breakfast. I like uh, two hard boiled eggs and a little piece of toast in the morning. So I'm happy to do that myself. And we don't eat dinner. That's another self care thing. We stopped eating a big meal at night. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you approve. Okay. Um, I'm all for that. I'm all for the intermittent fasting. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. When I started doing it, they didn't have a name called intermittent fasting, right. but I realized after they invented that concept that that's like, exactly what that. I do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't um, eat, we used to eat dinner around six o'clock at night. So we stopped doing that. I might have a little snack, uh, an apple or something like that. And, um, but I don't eat then again till, you know, 12 hours, 13 hours yeah. later in the morning. And the payoff for doing that for me is I always wake up, bing, I sleep six hours a night, I go to sleep at, at 10. And I wake up, bing, at four o'clock. I don't have an alarm clock or anything like that. But that's just when I naturally wake up. And a lot of it has to do when I used to eat a big dinner at night, I would wake up feeling muddy kind of in the morning yeah. in my head as well as in my body. But it's been years since I've awakened feeling anything, but bing, ready to go. And a lot of that too has to do, I think, with giving my body a rest from digestion overnight. So, uh, yeah, I, love I wish that. I'd known it was called intermediate fasting. <laughs> I, I would have felt more virtuous if I said, oh, I fast intermittently. 
<laughs> but but look at you paving the way in so many different areas. And now, you know, as we wrap this up, I would love to just hear a little bit about, you know, your new book, The Genius Zone, and just this what you're feeling right now. You just released the book, what, a, a month ago or so, month and a half, two months ago? Yeah. Um, and how, how are you feeling about it? Because I, you know, I'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah. Um, well, one th thing which really should surprise me about the new book, and it is that how many people are reading audiobooks or listening oh, to yeah. audiobooks, not reading audiobooks, but listening to them. Uh, the the number of audiobooks that sold this summer on the book, uh, it's like everybody was listening to it on the beach, kind of. I get yeah. uh, pictures on Instagram of people listening to it on the beach and reading it on the beach. And I'm happy to cons for people to consume it anywhere. What I want you to do, though, is take it home from the beach and sit down with it for an, for an hour and actually do the exercises in it. Mm -hmm. Because they're all taken from the very best things I've done with actual real live clients right here in this office where I'm talking to you from. And I recommend taking an hour of going through the exercises, whether you're reading it or listening to the audiobook, because there's real magic in putting those things right now into practice. So it's a book to be read, listened to, but it's also a book to be done. And yes. so get out your paper and pencil and uh, work. It's all there in the book. Uh, and you could save yourself, you know, corporations uh, send their CEOs to us for $25,000 a day to tune their CEO up. And you can get exactly the same thing in that book that uh, I do with my $25,000 um, CEO. So um, wow. uh, you can, you can save yourself uh, $24,980 <laughs> by uh, getting the book instead. Get the book. So I actually, I love being able to listen to your voice. There's something, uh, you know, where I feel like a connection um, listening to audiobooks, but I also love tangibly holding books. So I personally ordered both because I thought, well, if I'm either driving in the car or I'm on a walk, it's a great opportunity to listen. Um, but at the same time, I love like in uh, in The Big Leap, I would take the book out and I, I mean, my book's like a mess because I've written notes in it and all this throughout the years. And But doing the actual exercises really you know, it, I agree with you a hundred percent. And it's so, it's, it's so fabulous that you are dedicated to really serving so many people and giving this knowledge that you've learned in your, I mean, over how many years have you been doing this? 40? Well, I saw my first client in 1968 and I'm going to see my next one in about an hour. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. In so, between, so. we've seen about 25,000 people, I think, according to the Wow. And you have a new, uh, on your website, I was checking it out. You have a new course that's about to come out, uh, the end of September, right? And it's yes. all, all related to, to love and relationships. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. We have two big trainings a year. Uh, one is just about to start. It's our conscious loving training. That's based on our book, conscious loving that we were first on with, uh, Oprah 30 years ago and still is selling like hotcakes. I'm happy mm -hmm. to say. And, um, so we teach that once a year. And then the other course we teach is our one on body intelligence, where we teach a lot of the breathing and things that we uh, do for personal well-being, probably some of the same things that you teach your students. I love I it. I forgot to mention breathing. Yeah. Breathing is a really big discovery um, that I did over the past 50 years is learning how to use my breath and to teach people how to use your breath so that you can walk around feeling good all the time. Because a lot of that is not just how you eat, but how you breathe and how you align yourself in movement. Right. A hundred percent. Yeah. And that that's the side where I feel you know, I've learned that uh, very confidently, and I've had to learn a lot of the other elements of self-care by working with, you know, experts in different fields like you, where we can't all necessarily know everything, but if we support one another and work together and make these little baby steps over time, I believe that's where we can uh, have this zone of genius at our disposal all the time, whenever, and just sit in that zone. So now what I'd love to do is I do a little speed round to end every interview. So I'll just ask you a few questions. First thing that comes to your mind. And um, and then one last thing that I was just going to ask you about, and, and I can actually reach out to you after as well, is I noticed that on your website, you had something that said, um, 
Like you have different coaches in different cities. So, so within your Hendrix Institute, you, you and Katie, is it like you certify certain people to go and do the work as well? Yes, we certify Big Leap coaches to go out there and do the Big Great. Leap work. And also people um, uh, learn our relationship work too. We right. have a coach certification. Uh, that, yes, that. we've been uh, doing that uh, for, gosh, almost 30 years now. And so we have wow. a cadre of, I think, 1,200 or so coaches around the world and all sorts of different places. So you can find all that on our website. I love that. Okay, well, I'm going to have to reach out to you. Maybe that's something, maybe that's going to be one of my next ventures. I love it. So, okay, on to the speed round. First thing that comes to your mind, pizza or tacos? Pizza all the way. <laughs> Not a taco guy. <laughs> if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Mm. Mm. I'd love to be able to play the guitar like Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin, <laughs> whom I had the that. pleasure of uh, meeting one time, by the way. So uh, really, uh, yeah. Well, per- Plus, I've I've seen him a few times play, but I he he made an impression upon me as a really dedicated musician. You know, he was a born musician, committed. <laughs> <laughs> mm, committed, totally. Committed. Um, okay, and that actually is perfect for the next question. Uh, do you have a favorite celebrity moment or a favorite, you know, how you just mentioned him, like something like that? I do. I, I, I've got a stack of them, but the one I just came to mind, the first one that came to mind was yeah. meeting Elvis when I was 12 years old. And um, if I had, can tell the quick story... My mother was a newspaper reporter and got invited to interview Elvis Presley on his first big tour. Um, And he was going to pass through Orlando, Florida and do a concert there. And so we lived 40 miles away. So my mother got a press pass to go over and she got a pass for me, but I couldn't go back and interview Elvis. So I was a little disappointed about that. And I was standing in a park. My mother had to go inside with the other reporters about an hour before Elvis was supposed to get there. And so I was standing in a little park across the street from the Orlando Municipal Auditorium. And I'd been doing my homework there. I had to bring my homework because it was a school night. It was a Tuesday night. And so I was doing my homework there and I finished and I was kind of wandering around the park and I realized, oh, Elvis is going to have to come by here on his way into the parking lot, which was literally a block away. And so I just stood there on the curb and I was the only person there. And I just stood there and stood there and stood there. And finally, I saw a line of six white Cadillacs cruising down the street. And the first Cadillac pulls up in front of me and the window goes down and it's Elvis Presley in the passenger side. And he looks out and he says, hey, boy, you know where Orlando Municipal Auditorium is? And I was so dumbstruck. I couldn't even (laughs) say a word. All I could do was kind of hold my, I pointed my finger and kind of like (laughs) over behind those trees. And he said, thank you. Thank you very much. He rolls up the window, you know, and they drove (laughs) off. And <laughs> that, were, that was the dominant celebrity. Uh, I've had the opportunity to meet lots of uh, Grammy winners and Oscars winners since then, but uh, getting the chance to have an eye to eye 10 seconds with Elvis, man, that, that did it for me. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah, that's incredible meeting Elvis. Love that. And that just that story. Thank you for sharing. Um, is there anything that you are afraid of? Hmm. <laughs> I think the only thing I'm afraid of is I'll leave something incomplete when I die. I I don't want to leave anything incomplete. I want to make sure I've expressed everything I have to express before I check out of my mortal body. And I'm 76 now, so that's not a theoretical issue. And, uh, you know, so uh, get up there in your 70s and 80s and you start thinking more about mortality than I remember doing when I was in my 20s and 30s. Uh, So I think that's probably my, um, I have an intention 
of wanting to be fully evolved, loved, and loving as I exit this life. And so uh, if I have a little fear, it's maybe I won't get all that done. Wow. That's a, a brilliant in and of itself. And yes, leaving, I mean, you, you already have a massive global legacy that you're, you're living legacy right now. And you're sharing this with so many people. You have other coaches underneath you and Katie that are helping to spread the message that are, you know, teaching people about the genius zone and upper limit problems and all these things that you and I could talk about and you talk about for you know, every day of your life. What would be the one big takeaway for anyone listening today that you hope they can, you know, walk away and take home with them? Love as much as you can from wherever you are. Sometimes you're going to get stuck in life. And those are the very moments that are calling you to love yourself for just what you're feeling, just what's going on. I haven't found anything here on this planet that couldn't be healed in the spiritual and psychological dimension that couldn't be healed with love, because it's often the case that no matter what's got you stuck, the little kernel of what's got you stuck is that you, there's some part of yourself you haven't learned to accept and honor and feel and love in yourself. And until you do that, that continues to drive you into difficult situations. Uh, one of my favorite poets, Walt Whitman, said, I am large and contain multitudes. And we are all large and contain multitudes. And our job is to love that as much as we can so that then we can give the gift of love to other people. Well, that brought tears to my eyes because I, I I can't tell you how often I hear pretty much on a daily basis, someone that I'm working with say at the end of all, whatever we're working on, that they might not feel worthy of the self-care in whatever area. Um, and so, so if it's okay for just, just one last question that I'd like to ask you, because it just ties into what you're just saying about love, what would be the best tip you could offer to someone listening about how how to love those parts that they don't. Yes. The simplest tool that I've ever discovered is think of someone you know for sure you love. Just get the person's face in your mind. Like, uh, as I ask you that, uh, Jamie, who do you think of? My mom. Okay. So your mom. What's your mom's name? Sue. Sue. Okay. I love the look on your face when you think of Sue, you know, so <laughs> I already love Sue and I don't even know her just looking at the, She's great. <laughs> well, yeah. So let's just take a moment and honor and celebrate the feeling of love that you have for your mom, Sue. Feel where you feel that in your body, how you hold it in your mind. And now love yourself exactly like that. Give yourself some of that Sue love, because I know Sue would like you to do that. Wow, that's that's a wonderful exercise that I think anyone listening or watching right now, you can do that in this moment. It doesn't take long. And instead of um, being stuck in the, the fear or putting ourselves down and being hard on ourselves or the negative yeah, because I think we can look at someone else and say, oh, well, I love them or I'll help them or sure, I'll help you with this. But when it comes to ourselves, oftentimes us as givers, that part can be uh, the challenge. So Gay Hendricks, you are sensational. I, I cannot thank you enough for your time, for your energy, for your love, for being on What's the Word and inspiring everyone that watches this and listens to it. Um please, I hope we stay connected. I'd love to hopefully take one of your courses soon. For anyone that's listening right now, be sure to check out, it's, is it Hendrix.com? Yes, Hendrix.com, Hendrix. H-E-N-D-R-I-C-K-S.com. Uh -huh. -E yeah. Yep, Hendrix, make sure you get the C-K-S. <laughs> um, and I yeah. wanted to appreciate you for the work you've done and the work you're doing to live in your genius zone. It's clear that you're doing that. And uh, it's, a, it's a gift you're giving to yourself, but it's also a gift you're giving to lots of other people by inspiring them to live in their genius zone. Well, thank you so much. And I, I believe it's a constant practice. And when we can support ourselves with other individuals 
that can lift us up and then we can lift others. You know, that's, that's the, the way that I want to continue leading my life. So Gay, thank you so much. Sending my love to you and Katie. And I look forward to hopefully talking soon. And uh, once again, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for joining me here at What's the Word? Follow us on social media with the links on the screen. And don't forget to like and share with your friend. Your support helps us grow and continue to make inspirational content. See you next time on What's the Word?